We're going to get started in just a minute or two. Welcome, everyone. We'll wait on the line for a couple of more people to join on, and we will get started in about a minute. All right, we're going to get started. Thanks everyone for joining us. My name is Tracy Powell and I work on FBN Direct here at FBN. Uh, today we are bringing you our webinar about post-emergence herbicides with one of the members of our brand new agronomy team, which we will talk about in a minute, Doyle Earp. Uh, so today we are going to introduce that brand new agronomy team um, and then Doyle will take us through a presentation about post-emergence herbicides and finally we will walk you through some FBN direct offerings. At any time during the webinar today you can type your questions into the question box on your screen and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. Uh, so, as I've mentioned a couple of times already, we do have a brand new FBN agronomy team here. Uh, we've brought on in-house agronomy expertise. That's a new and growing team. They are contributing lots of content right now uh, out into the world for you to use. Webinars like this one, blog posts on FBN's Emergence blog. You can find that at emergence.fbn.com. Uh, contributions to our Tuesday Direct Protect emails. Our FBN podcast, you can download that on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play Music, uh, really anywhere you can find podcasts, and you'll find them in many more places soon. Doyle, who's going to lead our presentation today, is a senior staff agronomist here at FBN, and I will turn it over to Doyle to introduce himself to you, to have him uh, talk a little bit about why he's excited to be here at FBN, and then take you through the presentation. Thanks, Tracy. This is Doyle, and uh, yeah, I am excited to be with FBN. It's people that are looking out for the farmer. We're trying to make farming more sustainable. Uh, I've been an agronomist, owned my own business of a consulting agronomist in central and south central Nebraska for 37 years before taking this position. So I've had 40 years of experience doing agronomy work in central and uh, southern Nebraska and parts of Kansas. So I, I have a lot of experience, but that, I certainly don't know it all, that's for certain. Uh, but I am excited to be with, we have four agronomy people now in our agronomy team, and we're located all over. So anytime you need a question answered or a question about chemistry, fungicide, seed, anything to do with farming, you can always go to agronomy at farmersbusinessnetwork.com and write us a question and our sales team will, our sales cloud will get to you. We have nothing to do with sales. We are there for education and answering questions. Okay, I think we're gonna be talking today about post-emergence herbicide applications. Now, the first thing we need to know, of course, is what crop you're going to grow, whether it's corn, soybeans, 
wheat, whatever you're out there after, and what weeds are present, of course. But when you buy your crop this day and age, you get a lot of uh, traits that come with them, Roundup Ready traits, Liberty Link traits, and and BT, above ground insect and below ground insect and combinations of all of them. And you can have interactions with, with insecticides and herbicides. So there's, there's lots of things to keep in mind when you're thinking about your herbicide choices in addition to what the weeds are. Um, and everything is, herbicides are applied by stage of growth or height of the plant. For instance, glyphosate you can put on broadcast over the top to 24 inch tall corn. Uh, if you use drop nozzles, you can go to 30 inch corn. Atrazine, for instance, uh, you can put it on pre-emerge, pre-plant, or post-plant, post-emerge on corn, but you can only go up to 12-inch corn. Status, the dicamba product to kill broadleaves, you can go to 36-inch corn. Then other products like Armazon, you can go to V8 stage of growth of corn. AIM is V8 to V14. So it, it varies. So you need to know the stage of growth of that crop in order to select the proper herbicide for the timing that we have involved. Next slide. Like I said, we need to know the target weeds, whether they're a broad leaf. Uh, in this case, the one on the right here is a kochia plant, small kochia plant. And the one on the left is downy brome. Um, you just need to know what kind of weeds you have in order to know what type of herbicide to get. Between soybeans and corn, there's there's lots of different herbicides that uh, apply to both, but most of them, they, the best ones to control things are selective. They have to be used on soybeans only or corn only. There are exceptions like Liberty and Roundup and things like that, but for the most, most part, they are separate. And then the next thing you need to know, are you trying to keep the weeds from emerging or are they already up? And what size is that weed? Are in inches in height or the rosette overwintered, like the uh, mare's tail on the right there? And if you have any resistance issues that you're aware of, because with water hemp, the picture on the left, uh, most people have resistance to Roundup, ALS herbicides, uh, several of them. And so we have a difficult time controlling water hemp, as you all well know. So, to build in that re resistant management, we want to use several modes of action. Uh, the more modes of action we go with that uh, weed, the better off we're going to be. I always like to use at least three as a burn down and pre-emerge. Like uh, in corn, for instance, let's just say we want to go uh, bicep two, which would be atrazine plus s and then you're going to use glyphosate. All three of those are different modes of action. And then we would come back with something, let's say Callisto and Dicamba to clean up the escapes and give us some residual later. That would be two more modes. So then you have five modes of action working on those same primary weeds that are difficult to control. So that's, that's kind of what we want to do is use several modes of action and don't allow escapes. And then, and like I just said, let's always try to overlap uh, your pre's with a residual uh, and then cover that again with a post-applied glyphosate, dicamba, uh, and another, say, Outlook or Metulachlor or uh, uh, Acetachlor product for the small seeded broadleaves and grasses. The main thing we want to do is overlap herbicides and eliminate any escapes. Once the weed is up, it's harder to kill. Uh, that's one thing I was going to mention is like with dicamba. Dicamba is a great product because it can be picked up by the weed through the root system, through its shoot just coming out of the ground, and by foliar. It is probably unique in that aspect. It, it can be picked up all three ways. Prowl, for instance, or trifurlin can only be picked up by shoot. So if you use prowl, that's the one you're supposed to mix in the top one to one and a half inches of soil, if possible. That's why is because you want those weeds that are germinating to grow through it and pick that trifurlin up. That's the only way it's absorbed and kills. Atrazine can go foliar somewhat, but mostly roots. That's why it's a good pre. So there's all, all sorts of these things like metulachlor, that's shoot and root. Now, 
so in other words, with metulachlor or dual, the common name, if you apply that to growing weeds, you aren't going to see any any damage to that weed more than likely because it doesn't pick it up foliar and it's already established itself. It's it's already shoot is out of the ground and the roots are below where the metulachlor is. So you're not going to get any uh, control once those weeds are up. But that's that's just good to know. Uh, what you need to know when you when you select a herbicide. Next slide, please. And then the next thing everybody always asks, and and it's and it's very difficult to say what rate should you use all these products. On the label, they always have a uh, rate range, and depending on the size of the weed and the density of that population. And then in the environmentally, how bad the weather is, whether it's hot and dry or the weeds are stressed. When you're trying to do a foliar application, when weeds are stressed, those stoma protect themselves and those leaves the same as corn when it rolls up showing drought. And it does not absorb the chemistry as well. So I guess if there is a rule of thumb, the larger the weed, the higher the rate, but that's always not necessarily the deal unless it's hot and dry, but uh, go to the medium rate is usually a safe bet. And if you've got a high population, go to the higher rate. And if you just got scattered ones that you're just trying to clean up, then maybe you could get by at the low rate. But I do not like going the low rate. It just encourages escapes. Next thing I wanted to mention were the adjuvants and, and why we need them. Um, adjuvants. They aren't herbicides, they're additions to the herbicides to get them activated and to make the herbicide work better on the weeds. So um, basically what an adjuvant does, like NIS, which stands for non-ionic surfactant, if you wanna, I think the next slide is the list. Uh, the purpose, okay, one more slide, please. Yes, uh, NIS, the bottom one there listed, that's non-ionic surfactant. What that does is it's known as like a spreader. Uh, if, if you've ever waxed a car and you see the beaded up water when it uh, rains or you wash it, that beaded up water is what the cuticle has when it has wax on the cuticle of those weed leaves or corn or whatever you're spraying. The non-ionic surfactant breaks that surface tension so it spreads it out equally. It will not beat up. And that's very important that that makes the herbicide spread across that leaf, giving it a better chance of being uh, absorbed by the plant and less chance of it to roll off and hit the hit the soil. The nionic surfactant, certain chemistries and glyphosate is one of them that they, they really do like to have that on there to make sure that the plant is well covered. Uh, the AMS goes along with that. Uh, NIS when it comes to glyphosate and AMS is simply there. It's a chemical process of eliminating tie up from your glyphosate to the calcium that's in your water. You add the ammonium sulfate first, the sulfate combines with your calcium and magnesium in your water and the ammonium ion becomes a free nitrogen ion. And um, that makes the glyphosate more accessible to the plant. Without that, you have a uh, tie up of the glyphosate and the calcium, and you may not get any control at all in real hard water situations. Crop oil concentrate, uh, it's kind of like a surfactant, but uh, oil concentrate is there for two purposes. One is to stick the product on the leaf to make it uh, absorb on that leaf. And the other is to melt the cuticle of that leaf. So the cuticle kind of gets broken down by the crop oil that's also got the herbicide with it. And the herbicide then can enter through the stoma much easier with the crop oil, even in drought situations. Extreme drought situations in certain products, they want MSO. And MSO is methylated seed oil, same as crop oil, but it's just a hotter mix and it melts that cuticle more uh, than does the crop oil concentrate. If you see some burned leaves, you may see it with the mentholated seed oil more than the crop oil because it just melts that cuticle. And of course, 
it does the same thing on the corn as it does on the wheat. It melts that cuticle and then you may see some leaf burn. And there's always a risk when you do that. Most of the time it's minor if you follow the, the rates that are written in the label of the crop oil and seed oil. Uh, the, the hotter the environment, the weather and drought, the more mentholated seed oil I would recommend just because it's, it, those plants are hardened and they're under stress mentholated seed oil really melts it down and, and allows that herbicide that it's being used with to enter the plant. So those are the four things. There are other adjuvants. There's a, a high, high non-ionic surfactant and a few others, but these are the most that you will use for, I would say, 95% of the time. Next slide. Then the other thing I was going to say is uh, make sure you always read and follow the label it's the law the, those labels can tell you everything about that product and as you can see here if you go to the store for farmers business network and you look up a product like the red arrow shows you there it's uh that's the roundup power max label and if you click on that it'll take you right to it everything you need to know about that product is in there um they don't make those things up to make it hard on farmers. They, they put it in there to make it safe to use. They make it in there to make it the most efficient and get the most bang for your buck when you buy the products. It's, it's not guesswork. It is, it's a lot of research. A lot of money has gone in to make that label. And like I say, it is the law. So with that, I uh, would take a question or two if there are any. Uh, don't know if there are any, but I'd sure be glad to try to take some. Uh, we do have a couple questions, uh, uh, but we'll get to those in one second. Um, we're just going to walk through some of our FBM Direct offerings that we have on right now. Uh, FBM Direct uh, is our uh, inputs business here at FBN, where you can purchase herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, adjuvants, um, and fertilizer right through our online store. Our FBN direct model relies on transparent pricing, no rebates, no haggling, um, savings thanks to our farmer direct model. We're cutting out the middlemen and uh, working directly to get high quality inputs at a fair price for you and convenience. You can always order online or in, right from our mobile app and get direct delivery to your farm or to one of our local warehouses. Speaking of those warehouses, uh, we have brand new in-season distribution centers that have popped up all over the country. Uh, we've already added uh, a number of distribution centers and we'll be adding even more over the next couple of weeks. Uh, stay tuned to see if there's a warehouse that's come uh, near you. In season, we have an in season financing offer with a 4.5% annual uh, rate and no payment due until December 1st of this year. And you can always keep looking out for our deals of the month where you get special offers on products that are relevant for any given month our price alerts, price alert texts, and our monthly pest polls. And just a reminder, you can order via our online store or always give us a call at 1-844-200-FARM if you prefer to order over the phone. And uh, you can also always ask our agronomy teams questions by texting the word agronomy to 313131. And one of our agronomists will get back to you to answer your question. But in the meantime, we have a couple of questions for Doyle uh, that have come in during this presentation. Just pull those up. Um, so are there times when both NIS and crop oil concentrate or MSO are needed in the same spray mixture? No, there is not. Um, usually you only need one. I mean, if you have a product that's one says you can add NIS or COC and the next product says COC, you go with COC. Uh, if it says MSO only, you go MSO only. No, you don't need to do both in any situation. It's just one or the other, and whichever the primary herbicide you're using, the most important one in your mix, that's the one you want to go with. And what happens if too much NIS or uh, any other adjuvant is added to that spray mixture? Too much NIS isn't going to hurt you other than expense. COC and MSO, on the other hand, um, that, that could cause you some extra crop 
damage on the leaves or whatever it may strike. Uh, so you don't want to don't want to do that. Generally, COC and MSO are a one percent spray mixture, and uh, yeah, NIS is like a quarter of a percent. So you you'd have to use a lot to get in trouble. But at the same time, you could see leaf burn and a little crop damage if too much COC or MSO is used. This particularly MSO. Right and. Uh, last question and um, last chance for questions as well. So the last question we already have in is, what if one herbicide restricts any adjuvant use, but another herbicide in the mixture says to add one, add an adjuvant? Well, again, read the labels and, the, and you can figure this out. But if you have a herbicide that says, do not add anything, any adjuvants, for instance, that would be like Liberty or Glufosinate. And the other one says to add NIS, say you wanted to put Roundup with it for some reason, go with the one that says do not add anything. Otherwise, you may have a uh, bowl of cottage cheese. It would not be compatible. So, uh, and I always encourage when you're combining any mixes of chemistries, even though it says it will do it or it doesn't say you can't do it, it's probably possible, but I encourage doing a jar test first before you load that sprayer. It's easier to clean up a quart jar than it is a whole sprayer and booms and tips and things like that. So always do a jar test when you're combining and making mixes. Great. Uh, doesn't look like we have any other questions that have come in. So thanks everyone for joining us today and we will wrap up and hope to see you on another webinar with our agronomy team soon.